I had every intention of living to 100, but <laughs> now I have to live up to 100 to live up to Abby's introduction. Can you imagine that? I mean, and, and, and she even got the cigar, you know? <laughs> right, right. Well, now in your goodie bag, you need one contact lens. <laughs> um, very hard to follow that introduction. I mean, I, I, maybe I could have just fainted over there and then you would. <laughs> um, and I guess I do now know, what, you know at the Academy Awards when they say it means so much because it comes from your, your peers? Now I know exactly what they mean because we here are a community and we, a lot of us know each other, right? A lot of us have been through campaigns and trouble and Sturm and Drang and sleepless nights together. And even if we don't know each other, uh, we share a worldview, we share hopes. Um, but it's true that I am a little worried about becoming the Jose, what I think of as the Jose Greco of the women's movement. You remember Jose, Jose Greco was the only Spanish dancer anyone knew? Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to be the Jose Greco of the women's movement. So um, I, I did ask the organizers um, if I could be a, I don't know, a container for other people. And so you're going to see, I hope, some other, at least one other person, maybe a few other people come out here and, and share my time. Um, because it is true that part of the reason you know me, uh, as you know, Bella Abzug and Shirley Chisholm and Flo Kennedy, who I devoutly wish were here with us today, is because there were so few of us then. We were like 12 crazy ladies, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> And now there are many, many, many more of us. So I asked permission to introduce you to a few who are great leaders now, who give me faith in the future because they are half my age. So uh, we had a little discussion and they said, well, no, you have to talk about the past and the future, just a few little things like that, okay? <laughs> so. I'm going to go through a few things uh, just to remind you, go as fast as the wind, and do them short, somewhere between haiku and Twitter. Uh, and uh, just give six examples of what I was asked to talk about. Um, but I am going to be a Trojan horse at the end. One, we've already heard about equal pay. Pre-feminism, I would like to remind you that even in public opinion polls, Americans said women didn't need the money. The idea was that women were working for pin money. Now, equal, equal pay has majority support, even though we don't have it yet, of course, uh, but we have made progress. And we are still letting employers profiteer off women's work. I think we think about equal pay without thinking about who the profiteers really are. And in fact, we need to connect this to the national economy and understand that equal pay would be the best economic stimulus this country could ever possibly have. But you don't even hear equal pay and economic stimulus in the same sentence, right? In fact, there would be $220 billion every year in the economy just from equal pay. And after all, women are not going to put it in a Swiss bank account, they are going to spend it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it would also reduce taxes by reducing the number of people needing government services. Two, 
we've proved that women can do what men can do, but not yet that men can do what women do. <laughs> as, as Abby said, uh, many women have become the men we wanted to marry, right? But what about the other half of it? Too few men have become the women they wanted to marry. <laughs> So we're still in the, uh, and because we're still the only advanced democracy in the world with no national system of childcare, and yet our work patterns have become ever more obsessive. Japan used to beat us, you know, but now we're even more obsessive than Japan. Um, so it is simply impossible for anyone, male or female, to have it all if it means doing it all. Get mad, rebel, ask for childcare, don't take it anymore. Anger is a very important emotion. Three, <laughs> we've proved, and we have proved, I think, and changed the laws and the procedures profoundly, that rape is not sex, it's violence. And it was considered inevitable, normal, and natural before we started. But we have nowhere near proved that erotica is sex and pornography is dominance and violence. It's even present in the words. Eros means love, mutual pleasure, shared pleasure. Porne means female slaves. We won't censor, but we will and must create the same social penalty for pornography that we would for anti-Semitic or racist or homophobic propaganda. Right now, sex education is so often suppressed in private as well as public schools and private schools in this city um, that the uh, unreality of pornography sometimes becomes the only sex education kids have. We need to rebel. We need to get angry. Four, the civil rights movements inspired the Native American movement the women's, and incidentally, the Native, Native American women inspired the suffrage movement. Do you know that? Interesting, no? That's the source of the button, you know, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the Native American movement and the women's movement were very much inspired by the civil rights movement and helped by the legislation it worked to get. Um, Yet, we still don't quite understand that you can't perpetuate racism or class or caste in India and elsewhere without controlling reproduction and women's bodies. It's not possible to be a feminist without being anti-racist, and racism cannot be defeated without equality for women. They are inextricably intertwined, and we must see that they are always, always seen that way. Five. Um, people ask me on campus, for instance, why the same groups are against, say, lesbians and contraception. This seems odd to them. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we may still have to explain why it makes sense. All those groups that are against us, that are trying to control reproduction and thus re inhibit sexuality, they all believe that sexuality is only okay if it's directed toward having children inside a patriarchal system. And that is a lie about human sexuality. It has always been about bonding and closeness. It is not only about reproduction. But sometimes I fear that our adversaries know that we're all part of one movement better than we do. This is especially dangerous right now when the anti-equality folks uh, are in emergency backlash mode because in about 20 minutes this will no longer be a majority white or European American country. And they are determined to see to it that as they put in their tracts the white race does not commit suicide. It is a serious time. It is a dangerous time. It is a time of a few people in backlash, but very powerful groups in backlash.
We need to get mad. We need to do something. Six, domestic violence is no longer just called life, as it once was. We do have laws. We do have shelters. Yet if we count up all the American women killed by husbands or boyfriends since, say, 9-11, and then we count up all the Americans killed in 9-11 in Iraq and in Afghanistan combined, and combine all of those, many more women have been killed by their husbands and boyfriends than Americans were killed in 9-11 Afghanistan and Iraq. But how much do we hear about domestic terrorism compared to what we hear about foreign terrorism? Combine that with sex trafficking and forced reproduction in some form in most countries, right now publicized in Nigeria, but it goes on all the time. They do not kidnap women in their 50s and 60s. They kidnap, kidnap child bearers, the one thing that the male establishment cannot do. Plus, sun preference in many parts of the world that has created femicide in much of Asia. Also, the so-called honor killings, child marriage, sexualized violence in war zones, and as a result, for the first time in the history of the world, as far as we know, Women are no longer half of humanity. On the planet, there is a world sex ratio of 101.3 men to 100 women. It is a first. Now, I've told you some good but also bad news, and I do want you to meet the leaders half my age from whom I learn. The first two are away doing their work, but I want you to know about them. I want you to know this because there is a big and long time and growing men's movement against violence and for equality that has never got its proper rec recognition in this country. You may know American pioneers of this global movement, like Robert Allen in Oakland, California, or Michael Kimmel here in Long Island. But this morning, I want to introduce you long distance to Ted Bunch and Tony Porter, founders of A Call to Men. They are off doing their work in Hawaii and Minneapolis, respectively, at this very moment providing anti-violence and pro-equality education to men, boys, and communi communities. Also training teachers and athletic coaches who are the heroes to boys and are changing men, boys' lives. These two African-American men have been doing this brave, effective, innovative work for a dozen years. They are heroes to me. So remember and look up a call to men it's a hope for all of us. Sometimes I'm asked who... <clears throat> Sometimes I'm asked uh, who I'm passing the torch to. Uh, and also, I want you to know I get emails that say things like, regain your independence, purchase a walk-in tub. You can't make this stuff up, okay. <laughs> but when they ask me who I'm pa passing my torch to, I always say, I'm keeping my torch, thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm using my torch to light other torches. Because unless each one of us has a torch, we can't see where the hell we're going. <laughs> it is such a hierarchical image, don't you think? This idea of one torch. That's the enemy. That is not us. <laughs> so I wanted you to meet two women leaders who are always leaders and across many, many issues and they have always had torches of their own. They did not need me to light their torches. I learn from them, they inspire me as Abby inspires me. Um, 
and there's only time for an introduction of their unique voices, and one of them is, is coming from the airport in a taxi coming here. Is, is Salome, yeah, she's right here. Yeah. back here? Fantastic, you see? <laughs> the goddess delivers, okay. <laughs> um, first, I want you to meet a woman who pioneered feminist organizing online, who also pioneered the third, third wave, has written more books than I have, and remember she's half my age, is a brilliant organizer, started a feminist lecture bureau called Soapbox, and sometimes, um, and, and, and something here in New York that should be in every city, every city in the United States, it's something I want you to hear about from Amy Richards. Amy. I have one minute. So what Gloria is talking about is something that's called feminist camp. And I swear it was not until I got in here this morning that I realized totally that I had sub hidden it that the New York Women's Foundation was the inspiration for feminist camp because watching all of these organizations here was my introduction when I was on the allocations committee 20 years ago to taking the theory, the values, the ideas I had of feminism that I'd learned in college, that I had shared with my friends, you know, we're fierce, we're feminists, we're in your face, we're equal rights advocates, and I had to put it into practice. I had to look at people and see what fair housing meant. I had to go to an abortion clinic and see what that looked like in real time. And I realized that I learned that at the New York Women's Foundation, and so what I try to do through the feminist camps, and now we have over 200 campers, is to extend that same generosity and to take people around New York City and to introduce them to what feminism looks like today. So you can either go on feminist camp or you can just keep coming to the New York Women's Foundation breakfast. <laughs> Um, and finally, I want you to meet a woman who is transforming academia by teaching Africana studies uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, transforming readers by her wonderful writing, and healing survivors of uh, violence by using her own experience. It's a final, it's a form of healing, right? To use our own experience and her organizing experience to heal others, Salamisha Tillett. Thank you. It's a beautiful room for a beautiful woman. Um, I just want to say that I came from Stanford because I was working with college students to organize against sexual assault there, and we know it's a huge epidemic. It's the number one violent crime that college students are experiencing. Um, but I also want to say, to reiterate Gloria's point, that uh, gender violence is the number one impediment for gender equality, for racial justice and democracy here in the U.S. and throughout the world. I mean, it's so with that spirit that I, as an academic activist and rape survivor, co-founded A Long Walk Home in 2003 with my sister and visionary Shahrazad Tillett. It's an organization that uses art and activism to end violence against all girls and women, with a particular emphasis on our most vulnerable and most invisible uh, population, young women and girls of color. And so um, part of my mission is to change that invisibility into an investment, to think about ways in which you all and we here on stage can work with these, this population of girls who are not only um, the most vulnerable in terms of experiencing all forms of violence, but also the key to our future and to our liberation as a society. So our organization is A Long Walk Home. It's inspired by my actual journey um, coming home the night after I was sexually assaulted, but it's also to think about home as a transformative and healing space, home as community, home as friendship, home as feminism. So thank you very much. Okay, okay. We have a very short introduction to the most biggest treat of the morning. Okay, you and say the first part and I'll say Judy this. Judy Collins and she is fan fucking tastic. Yeah. 